I apologize. Good morning, good afternoon to all. Dear participants, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you warmly to today's webinar, Impacts of COVID-19 on Fisheries and Aquaculture in Europe and Central Asia. My name is Haydar Persson. I am Senior Fishery and Aquaculture Officer in the Power Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia. I am very happy to moderate today's webinar. The key objectives of this webinar are as follows. Examine impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on the fisheries and aquaculture industries and food security in the region. Provide an overview of government's responses to the pandemic to support the sector. Share good practices regarding industry and civil society responses to the pandemic and explore the sector's needs to mitigate immediate impacts of the pandemic and improve resilience in the longer term. Dear participants, let me share some technical information on the arrangement for this webinar. First, I would like to say something about a language option. This webinar is being conducted in two languages, namely English and Russian. Then we have an interpretation service. You can just switch a language by clicking on the small globe icon at the bottom. I also would like to highlight that this webinar is being recorded and broadcasted on YouTube. We are expecting your questions and comments in writing. I think this is an important point. Please, for this, use questions and answer box at the bottom of your screens for sharing your questions. Please do not use the chat for this proposal. However, a short biography of the key speakers will be appropriate in the chat box. I would like to highlight that this webinar targets government official, private sector representatives, civil society participants, research institutes, academia, direct or indirect linked to the sector of fisheries and aquaculture in Europe and Central Asia. About 350 people have registered for this webinar. Let me invite Raymond Fiehle, regional program leader, to open the webinar. Raymond, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, um, Haider. Um, good morning, dear colleagues, dear friends. Um, also, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, of course, in the region, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, panelists, and, and uh, participants. It's really an honor to welcome you to the regional webinar on the impacts of um, fisheries uh, and, and aquaculture or on the impact of COVID on the fisheries and aquaculture sector in Europe and, and, and Central Asia. Let me also welcome our colleagues from the fisheries division, uh, Mr. Marcio Castro de Sosa, senior fisheries officer and uh, his, uh, his team, who has really worked also closely with our regional office to prepare um, this webinar uh, session. On the 11th March, 2020, uh, so in fact, just one day more than a year ago, WHO has declared COVID-19 a pandemic, pointing to over 180,000 cases of the coronavirus illness in over 110 countries and territories around the world. Now, one year later, we have in total 116 million cases confirmed globally, and there are very few countries 
where the pandemic has not had any serious effects. So as we all experienced, really the pandemic COVID-19 has significantly impacted the global economy, global value chains, and we are really disrupted with lockdown measures uh, due to the virus in many um, parts of our daily life. The, the simple fact that we're going to have this uh, seminar also today is related to the fact that um, the COVID has really moved us to much, much more teleworking. So the pandemic has really hit almost all industries and sectors with long-term implications, including the fisheries and also the aquaculture uh, sector. Fish and uh, fish products, uh, as uh, I think many of you know, uh, currently constitute uh, the most uh, highly traded food commodity internationally with 221 states and territories having uh, some fish trading activity. So fish exports for human consumption in value terms are higher than the exports of all other animal proteins combined. More than, than one third of the world population is relying mainly on fish as a substantial part of the animal protein. In some of the African and some of the Asian countries, fish really provides more than half of their animal protein and are considered staple food. So fish is a key element of our food security and sustainable management of fish and aquaculture resources is instrumental in order to achieve the sustainable development goals. We are not even any more 10 years um, ahead to achieve the agenda 2030. So therefore, we really need to act on all fronts now. And the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the fish supply chain and operations have been still uh, profound. If we're looking into countries of the region, they have experienced varying degrees of impact of the COVID-19 based upon the various responses at the country and at the local level. So I'm really pleased to see that with the experts we have on this panel today, we will further explore these questions and I'm looking really forward to the discussion and sharing uh, this information. So the, the webinar today will continue the webinar series that we have started um, at the beginning of the pandemic last year, really aiming at facilitating multi-stakeholder dialogue on the impact of the COVID-19 on the food systems. And the webinars are creating a platform for sharing experience from the government, the civil society, the private sector on the challenges, the measures, and the opportunities for fisheries and aquaculture in light of the COVID-19 crisis. So I'm looking forward for the discussion. Um, I thank you for your attention and participation and um, please stay safe and healthy. Over to you, Heider, thank you. Uh, thank you much, Raymond, uh, for your opening remarks, also for your uh, great contribution to the, this event. Dear friends, now we are passing to the technical sessions. We will have the basic technical session. The first one titled The Global Scenario of Fisheries and Aquaculture and COVID-19 will explore how COVID-19 pandemic has affected the international trade patterns of the fisheries and aquaculture, uh, patterns of fisheries, trade of trade patterns of fisheries and aquaculture products in our region. And uh, the, the, this issue will be addressed by my colleague, Marcio Castro, who is the senior fisher officer of FO, and also now he's acting as the team leader in the FAO fisheries Division for International Trade and Markets of Fishery and Aquaculture Products. Then we will get a presentation which will only uh, outline 
the current station of this pandemic condition in in our region in Europe. I'm sorry, this will be a case study focusing on the Asia and Pacific. I think that will be very valuable to this event. And by bringing some case studies from the other region, I believe that the response to the pandemic has varied greatly by the countries and by the region. So it's my pleasure now to <clears throat> invite Marcio for his presentation. Marcio, please. Thank you, Haida. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, have a good day if you are outside Europe. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, Haidar and uh, the regional office and Raymond for organizing this event. We put, as, as Raymond mentioned, the importance of uh, fisheries and aquaculture products in terms of word, in terms of uh, word production, in terms of the dimension of income contribution and the uh, food security is enormous. So it's, it's uh, and also the effects that we've seen as Haider just mentioned, they are very differentiated around the globe. My, my idea here with my presentation is going to be more or less to, to, to bring uh, initial uh, global overview uh, to be able to set a stage for the party, for the other speakers so that we are going to focus more on the region. So I'm going to explain a little bit what are uh, the main characteristics of fish production and trade that has somehow uh, driven the sector, has somehow driven the sector to this point that we are in terms of uh, challenges and opportunities associated with COVID-19. Uh, first of all, I think it's, it's quite important that uh, in order for us to have a, 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 a true analysis of the fishery sector, uh, we have to be very, to pay a lot of attention in the nuances of the sector, because the sector is completely different from the other sectors in terms of animal protein. So we are talking about a sector that has some very unique differences. And we are going to explore those unique differences during my presentation. Uh, and in addition to that, we also have to see that, uh, and of course, we had uh, uh, most of the countries, I would say uh, all countries, have uh, faced serious problems with the pandemic. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, uh, the health issues, but also in the economic side associated with the production of not only fish, but food in general. But at the same time, we have to be a uh, uh, very pay a lot of attention in the opportunities that have appeared with this trade, with this pandemic. Uh, due to the pandemic, new, new ways of uh, selling the product, new ways of distribution the product, distributing the product, has, they, they have been found, they have been explored. So uh, the idea of this webinar is also not only look at the problems, but also look at the new opportunities that have appeared uh, uh, after the, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the sector of, uh, of, fish, of uh, fisheries and aquaculture, uh, so the sector of fisheries at large, it's, it's, it's already very different from the other animal proteins, starting from the type of production. Because if you go for, for poultry, for cattle, you only have poultry, you only have cattle. In, in our case, we start already with two types of production, the aquaculture and the capture fisheries. And they are, they are completely different in terms of their nature. They are completely different in terms of the inputs they use, the costs associated with the production, uh, the intensity of the user of uh, human labor, uh, the intensity of user of capital. So it's, it's already a very big difference since the beginning. 
in addition to that, we also have a, a wide range of type of producers. Uh, we have uh, industrial producers, we have small scale producers, and we have a significant participation of women in the fish production. So, uh, I mean, in the fish value chain. So this is very important that, uh, and indeed, small scale fishers is very, very important at a global level in terms of fish production. So we are already setting a very different scenario with multiple angles that exactly those multi multiplicity of angles, they were considered uh, exactly the, the turning point for not having only problems associated with the pandemic. Those differentiation between type of production, type of producers and other aspects that we are going to see, they have been associated also with being able to create opportunities for the participants of the value chain. And, and when I mention uh, aquaculture and white capture fisheries, it's important to have this uh, global idea because uh, as again, just to, to re reiterate that, here I'm presenting only the global perspective. So the idea of this, the webinar is exactly trying to come, start with the global perspective and then trying to narrow down. And we, we, in the global perspective, and it's very important in the last years to know the importance that aquaculture uh, is playing in fish production. The aquaculture here is the is the is the green the, the blue the blue area here in this graph. So in the last years, aquaculture is growing considerably at a much higher rate of growth than white capture fisheries. This is also a very important aspect in terms of uh, how the sector behave in terms of any challenges or any opportunities like the pandemic. And in addition, and just to present some numbers, some most recent numbers that you have, that we have here from FAO. Uh, you can see here that exactly the, the, uh, the capture fisheries, and it has grown only 3.7% in comparison with aquaculture that is almost reaching the same level of white, of white capture fisheries. So this is very important. Nowadays, we produce more aquaculture products than white capture fisheries in general, because we have a lot of aquaculture products that are direct to feed other animals. But if we think about only human consumption, we are very close to reach a level that aquaculture is going to surpass white capture fisheries. So this is very, very important in terms of, uh, of uh, how the, the sector is behaving. And in addition to that, we also have uh, some very significant numbers in terms of first sale. So the first sale of, of fish products in general is 400 billion US dollars. And aquaculture plays a very important and very significant role in that regard. And I mentioned in the beginning the, the, the importance of the social inclusion, the income distribution, the nutrition aspects. So just to illustrate a little bit the importance of the of fish production in terms of the human angle. And if we think, we, we see that there is a lot of people engaged in fish production worldwide. Uh, in particular, we have a huge concentration of fish workers in Asia. And furthermore, we have a huge participation, as I mentioned, of women in the value chain. If you look at the value chain, more than 50% of workers are women. 
and they are more concentrated exactly in the processing phase of fish and aquaculture products. And in addition to that, the small scale, we all know how small scale in general is important in every single country, small scale fishers. Some countries, they call them artisanal, some countries call them small scale. But this, this particular group is very, very important uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of the, the share of the global employment uh, towards fisheries and aquaculture. And in addition to that, it's very, uh, the problems and solutions that happen with the pandemic, it's also very associated with the long, the long characteristic of the value chain for fisheries and aquaculture products. Fisheries and aquaculture products, they have a very long value chain usually. Sometimes a fish is produced in one country, exported to another to be processed and re-exported to a third one to be consumed. So we have a very long uh, value chain in terms of, uh, of uh, fish production and trade. And in addition to that, fisheries and aquaculture products, they are very inclusive in terms of international trade. Because when you talk about uh, uh, cattle, when you talk about poultry, uh, countries can be self-sufficient. Uh, many countries are self-sufficient in poultry production, for example. But for fish, it's almost impossible due to the diversity of species. We have a, lot, a huge diversity of species. So even, even big producing countries, they have to import species that they do not produce. So there is this, uh, this map is from Rabobank, it's not an FAO map, uh, it's from the Dutch bank. And this map shows exactly how important at a global level uh, seafood trade is. We see the participation of many countries exporting at, and at the same time importing. So this is was this is was also related to all the effects that we had during the pandemic. And one important aspect uh, associated directly with the international trade is when you think about the export value of the main uh, uh, the main uh, animal proteins in the world, we see that fish represents 56% of all exports of animal proteins in value terms in the world. So we are talking about 18% for cattle, 14% for pork, 12% for poultry, and 56% for fish. So if you add all other animal proteins in terms of export value, it is still lower than fish. So the sector is highly dependent on international trade. And in addition to that, I mentioned that fishing usually has a very long uh, value chain. We have the production that can come up from white capture or aquaculture. We have processing distribution. We have uh, process and transportation, sorry. We have distribution and then consumption and export. So I mentioned international trade is a huge consumption, is a huge, uh, has a huge share in terms of, uh, of the fish market. So after the export, we are going to have again, sometimes processing and transportation, distribution and consumption. <laughs> so the value chain is really long. It's a long value chain. And in addition to that, uh, during the distribution phase, regardless if it's a domestic level or exported to another country, there is a huge market for a specific species in terms of the hotel, restaurants, and catering, what we call the Horeca sector. And that was, uh, this sector faced a lot of, uh, of changes during the pandemic. We all know that many restaurants 
they have been particularly closed at the beginning of the pandemic, including hotels. The sector of tourism has been reduced almost to zero with a huge impact on this distribution to the hotels, catering, and restaurants. And in many occasions, consumers were able to buy different species that they never uh, saw that species in the supermarket for the first time at an affordable price because there were, there were no market for those high value species in supermarkets, in hotels and catering services. So this is, was also one of the aspects of the changes that we had in terms of the pandemic in the market. Uh, in addition to that, I think it's, it's important to realize that uh, if, if we, we, we try to summarize what I have just said, we have two, oh, sorry. Uh, we have two types of, uh, of production, aquaculture and white capital. That was already an impact a, that caused a different impact. Developing countries, they participate a lot. Oh, sorry, I think there is a timer here. Uh, keeps moving, sorry for that. Uh, there is a, uh, developing countries participate a lot. International trade is very important, a long value chain, and we have small scale and, uh, and the gender inclusion. So those are the main characteristics of the sector. Uh, and in addition to that, what, what we have some, in terms of the, the major trends that are occurring right, right now in the market. For, for some products, we did have some shortening of the value chain. Uh, so uh, we did have some uh, shortening of the value chain. Uh, there are some try to reduce the logistic impacts, but at the same time, we are seeing now consumers uh, trying to know the product more. They want more information about the product in terms of uh, what the product look like, what the, where the fish was caught, what are the fishermen involved. The business has grown during this the pandemic and information is every time fundamental. And I, I want to stress that information is key. Eurofish is here, Infofish is here, FAO is here. We have to get information as much as possible. Information is key for us to readapt ourselves to challenges and opportunities. And uh, we have to be aware of market information, of the instruments that we have here. For example, those are some of the FAO instruments also available in Russian. And uh, in addition to that, I just would like to re re reiterate that uh, FAO has a specific uh, project called Globefish that we work very close with Eurofish and Infofish uh, to disseminate market information on prices, on border rejections, on markets. And that's fundamental as I mentioned. Information is fundamental to reposition ourselves for any, to any challenge. I would like to thank you all again, uh, and uh, back to you, Haider. Thank you. Uh, Marshall, thank you very much for your representation. For the sake of time now, immediately, I would like to pass to the second uh, presentation, which will be delivered by the by Ms. Shirlan Maria Anton Sami, Infofish Managing Director. As I stated, this uh, this uh, talk will be focusing on the mitigation, adaptation measures, and other good practices from cases from Asia and Pacific. Shirlan, please, it's your turn. Thank you, Haider. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here. And just uh, let me just quickly share my screen. Okay, yeah, so uh, let me first uh, thank FAO uh, and also the regional office for Central Asia and um, 
Europe for inviting InfoFish to be part of this very, very important uh, webinar and timely one as well. Uh, COVID-19 has part of our lives now since over a year. And uh, it's really something that um, is being heard and talked about almost every day. Uh, there is some occasion to talk about the impact of COVID or how it's changing our lives every day. So uh, my presentation will talk a little bit about uh, what's happening or what happened over the past year in Asia and the Pacific region. Uh, what are the um, mitigation and adaptation measures that, uh, that took place and continues to take place. And some of the other good practices, um, examples from the Asia Pacific region. Now, in spite of the profound uh, impact that it has had on the fishery and uh, seafood sector in the Asia Pacific region, uh, we do, we are, we, we want to be optimistic about the situation as much as possible. And uh, we'd like to also present uh, what are the positive trends and opportunities that have come from this region as, and, the, and like to highlight here the key points that we've been hearing since the start of this, um, event is um, food security, source of protein, and challenges and opportunities. So uh, just to uh, give you a quick re recap of uh, what happened uh, from early last year, the whole situation started from the disruption of trade, seafood trade uh, began from China when the borders started closing down. Many of the suppliers to this market were affected. Uh, particularly those who single-handedly uh, or single um, uh, targeted China as, as a sole market. They were the ones who were uh, pretty much uh, affected quite badly at that time. And then, of course, when the pandemic uh, it became a pandemic, all the countries uh, began, most countries started closing their borders and we, had, we started to see disruption in seafood value chain, distribution channels were affected. Um, retail channels were blocked and then we were having um, problems um, getting supplies from the wet markets to the consumers. Uh, the retail sector, as Matthew uh, mentioned just now, was, um, was the most severely affected. And of course, we started seeing changes in price, uh, seafood um, prices, declines and so on. Um, against this backdrop, what happened was, of course, consumers were not getting their product and um, processors, wholesalers, producers were frantically trying to get this product that is stuck with them to the consumers. Now, in this process, what happened was they started looking at innovative ways to how, how should I get my product? So this is where we started seeing a rise in usage of online platforms to get the product to the consumer. So there was a significant increase um, starting to, to take place in terms of using these online platforms to sell the products. And of course, initially we had that hiccup in trying to get the product, but then eventually when this platform appeared and it became something which was very much uh, facilitating, um, this started increasing. So we started seeing uh, GrabFood, Shopee, Lazada, Tmall, Alibaba, all being channels to sell the seafood to the consumer. This included not only fresh, frozen, but also processed and ready to serve canned seafood. Um, just to give you a quick uh, you know, a, a view of the types of delivery that's available in, in Asia, you also have uh, some which are Asia-based and also Deliveroo, uh, which is uh, European-based, which are also now doing pretty well in some of the countries in Asia Pacific region. So Food Panda and Grab Food and some of, uh, are some of the, the most popular ones in, in this region. And then, of course, you also have institutional retailers, supermarkets, hypermarkets, who are also creating their own platforms to have the food delivered to the consumer. Uh, this includes, um, it gives you an option uh, for the consumer to either just purchase it online and have it delivered to the house, or you can have the option to have a personal shopper to do the shopping for you. And then you can pick it up at a designated time and location or have the personal shopper deliver it to your house. So these are some of the convenience or rather the options that uh, these um, uh, institutional retailers and other players along the value chain were using. 
Now, in addition to that, we were also seeing producers, processors, and wholesalers, traders themselves who started creating their online platforms uh, to have their options directly delivering, uh, delivering the product to the consumer. So this is where you saw the drop um, uh, in the number of uh, channels or the, the, the steps in the whole supply chain. So the, the number of uh, middlemen in the whole supply chain was being reduced. And in this option, producers, wholesalers, and processors were able to, to give more options to the consumer. And if you see some of the, uh, some of the options that were available are even different type of fish cuts. For example, uh, in addition to fresh or frozen option, consumers were able to choose whether they want the fish whole or whether they want the fish in portions or steaks or in fillet. Um, also, uh, options for them to choose kids meal, something that uh, is suitable, different cuts for, um, to cater for, for children, as well as for the elderly. So now, what I would like to highlight here also is the fact that in generally in Asia, we eat fish whole and fresh. So now with this pandemic, we had to, there, we, we've seen a shift in the way consumers are looking for seafood. We are starting to see an increase in the number of um, sales of frozen fish and frozen seafood. And this is something which uh, we have, uh, the, the, the region has adapted to. It's okay, I need to have, I can go, I can buy frozen fish, I can keep it for a long time, just because situations has changed. Uh, here, I'd like to quickly show an interesting um, way of how, uh, another way which, which has been happening in Asia is online marketplace, where some of the traders in these retail markets and wholesale markets, as well as wet markets, are using this way to sell their, uh, promote their seafood and have the delivery of the, of the product. So there are two videos here, uh, which I'll quickly show because of time. The first video basically talks about um, or shows this trader having a set of products, different uh, variety of seafood and, and a special offer limited for only one minute. So within one minute, you've got to purchase, uh, make the order and you get it at a special price. Now the second video shows you how a retailer at a wet market and frozen market or um, wet market, sorry, is uh, offering his product, uh, her product at a very special uh, price. And basically is telling you, this is how your product is gonna look like and you can make your order through uh, a WhatsApp or a, or a linked app. So I'm just gonna quickly um, show you the first one. <laughs> And the second one. you never request, uh, we will send it as whole like this. Okay, unless you all key down. Those that never tried before our system. Okay, after life, uh, please, before soon, get part, everybody must proceed to the messenger, your Facebook messenger. Click on the link, it will lead you to this page. Okay, address everything and we will go by whatever that you key down. So if you key wrongly, yeah, we will send we, the driver sent to the wrong unit, we are not responsible. Okay, so Tom Yo, the last step, select standard delivery, upload your screenshot of payment. Okay, here you must key down box and ice because by default we do not provide. If you just request, we will give it to you. Okay, so so this option gives you also the way of how you want your product to be delivered, whether you want a box or whether you want ice or how it, how it's, how uh, the preference uh, that uh, you would like to have it uh, done. Now, uh, the other way how uh, seafood is really uh, widely being sold in this region uh, these days is uh, using social media, particularly Facebook and even to uh, to a certain extent in LinkedIn. Now, Facebook, in Facebook, you have a, a myriad of ways on how uh, these traders, uh, retailers are promoting their seafood uh, as live, as even frozen and fresh product and giving them special offers to uh, get this uh, uh, seafood to be delivered to them. So it's, it's very interesting and in how retailers are competing to find innovative ways to get the fish and seafood to the consumer. And this includes also in the Pacific region. For example, if you look at this uh, picture to the right on this on the on the screen, 
is where um, some fishermen are sh uploading live videos of the fish freshly caught from the boat and telling them that, okay, uh, this is this is this fish, this is how much it weighs, and this is how much it's going to cost, and you can get it from this particular location at, at this particular price. So um, these are some of the options that are being available for consumers. Um, besides, uh, these uh, have been happening a lot in the domestic trade uh, with the block, uh, with the lockdowns and uh, restrictions in uh, import and export. Uh, there's been a very strong growth in the domestic markets in this region, and I think it's uh, quite similar in other regions as well. Uh, I'd like to highlight here that uh, the World Trade Organization had um, recently reviewed the contraction rate of trade, uh, which was initially uh, forecast at between 13 and 32 percent in 2020. They have now revised the rate to 9.2 percent for last year and forecast to grow at 7.2% this year. So this is basically because things are starting to improve. We are starting to see uh, the lifting of lockdowns in most of the countries, which is uh, facilitating this recovery. Uh, as I said, also uh, market diversification is playing a very important role in the growth or development of this um, sector. Um, countries, producers are looking for new markets uh, to get the supply since they had um, since badly, since they were badly affected uh, by solely depending on the Chinese market for some of these producers. Uh, also, to uh, important to mention here that international trading continues to have uh, obstacles uh, as we are uh, uh, attempting to uh, supply and buy from this market simply because of the additional checks and requirements at the borders. So uh, the domestic market plays a very important role, uh, particularly also since governments in this region are prioritizing food security. Also, just to quickly show some figures here as, as what we mentioned just now about the growth in the, the, the positive growth in the trade. Uh, here you can see the different, sect, um, the different segment times of uh, 2020, January, May, January, July and January, December, although we do see the contraction there, it has almost come down by half of what it was in the first five months of last year. And in some cases, you also see um, uh, some positive um, growth, uh, similarly for imports here. And um, just to also add on, in, uh, in addition to um, producers, you also see the airlines who have been quite badly affected um, and these are some of the airlines here, which I'm mentioning is uh, Thai Airways, uh, Taiwan, and um, Singapore Airlines, which serve uh, a, a big part of their um, a meal menu on, on the plane has seafood. So they are bringing their, um, creating that environs in the, um, the airlines uh, or the aeroplane on, on the, uh, in, in areas in the city itself, creating cafeterias that look and feel, have the feel like experience in the plane and where seafood is also being served. So just to quickly wrap up, I'd like to highlight that the uh, demand in the Asia Pacific region for seafood globally is also is very strong. Uh, in the Asia Pacific region, we have uh, among the countries with the highest per capita fish consumption in the world. And we also uh, in the region where uh, some of the countries pay the highest for seafood so we've been seeing a significant increase in retail uh, grocery sales and takeout as well. And this is actually um, going to keep growing for the time being. We are in this era of online seafood trading where um, we are, we, the, the industry is looking for ways to how to survive. Uh, just to also mention that in some countries in the region, they're also looking at how to uh, produce their own food. Uh, this is an example in the Philippines where uh, the Bureau of Fisheries are, uh, uh, has embarked on empowering communities to produce their own food using aquaponics. And this is something which uh, consumers that can also do it uh, in their own backyard. Uh, just a final slide. As we see this growth, this tremendous growth in the way seafood is being sold and how this digital world is uh, taking the this whole industry by storm. The question is, will this bubble burst? Is this growth going to burst? We really don't have much data, uh, as in how much seafood is sold online, how much is uh, consumed through food delivery, but definitely 
it's uh, pretty obvious that this, this is really strong. 50% uh, of the world population is on social media. So this is, this is something uh, that's a very, uh, it's a food for thought. And uh, industry should be focusing on this industry and technology, innovation and technology, which is going to characterize the growth of this sector uh, from now on. And we really got to be um, uh, mindful of what consumers want, cater to the consumers better, longer shelf life and variety is going to be what we are looking for. Thank you. Helen, I sincerely thank you for this very useful and informative uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to encourage the participants okay, I mean, uh, to, to make remarks or put their questions uh, to, the, to the questions and uh, answer uh, box. Now we are entering in the other session, which is major impacts of uh, COVID-19 on fisheries and aquaculture will change in Europe and Central Asia country round table. As highlighted by Marcia, the fisheries and the body chain of the fisheries and aquaculture products are very long. So in this session, we would like to see the impacts of the pandemic on the specific component of this long body chain. Under this uh, this session, we will look four countries as case countries from our region, two of them from the Central Asia and the others from the, the, the Europe. I, I now invite my colleague Marcio uh, to facilitate uh, this session. Marcio, it's your turn, please. Thank you. Thank you, Hedda. Uh, we are going now to have the uh, presentation of Eurofish uh, talking about the impact of COVID-19 in the fishery sector in Europe. As I mentioned before, Eurofish is part of the InfoFish network and in FAO we work very closely with them in terms of project development, particularly involving markets, uh, market opportunities, trade. So Catalina, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marcio. Добрый день, дорогие уважаемые коллеги. Uh, good morning to everybody. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here and thank. I want to thank uh, on behalf of Eurofish, the entire team of the FAO for organization of this important webinar. I will switch now to my presentation. My presentation will be focused on the effects of uh, coronavirus on fisheries sector in some selected countries. Uh, it will be examples of how the government, industry and civil society respond to the impacts of coronavirus. In general, no matter if you consider local, national or international levels, seafood supply chain in each country are very highly integrated into the overall seafood supply chain. Therefore, the consequences how each country reacts to the effects of the pandemic, uh, these effects have global consequences for the seafood industry as a whole. In general, the sector is subject to direct and indirect impacts through reduced functions of the fishing fleet, impacts on the processing uh, sector, fish farming companies, fish trade, we see the changed culture of consumers. We see the impacts on the employment, impacts on the food security, policy implications, and so on and so on. But here I would like to show you some examples of disruptions uh, in the selected countries and how the government or industry reacted for certain specific uh, parts of the value chain. The United Kingdom. As in many other nations, the UK economy was seriously disrupted during the um, COVID. There was an early disruption in the seafood uh, processing industry 
on the supply chain as the COVID outbreak affected seafood uh, processing companies. According to Seafish, up to 75 to 80 percent of the seafood processing plants had to either reduce the processing operations or even completely close during the first half of 2020. The remaining 20 to 25 percent of the seafood processing plants um, continued either as nor at normal levels or even increased the levels of operation. And usually those businesses included small workplaces or family businesses. But anyway, all the processing companies had to go through significant reconfiguration in order to be able to adjust to COVID-free operations. There was a major collapse in, this, in the food service sector due to the several cycles of lockdowns and the Second quarter of 2020 was the har hardest for the UK food service, where there was noted a 77% of reduction in visits during that quarter. This reduction in visits in the Horeca sector were partly compensated by the increased retail sales. And these retail sales were focused on the growth and uh, innovation of the products, uh, which was done by both multiple retailers, fish wholesale companies, and fish, um, fishmongers. In July, the chancellor of the exchequer, Rishi Sunak, announced the government scheme, Eat Out to Help Out. The scheme was implemented to encourage people to get back to the restaurants, cafes, and pubs and to improve the UK's economy. And in particular, this initiative meant that from Monday to Wednesday during August, the government had paid half of the cost of the meal up to 10 pounds per person. So activities at the restaurants were slightly improved, but yet they remained a 42% below 2019 level during the third quarter of the last year. The impact of COVID in the retail was more variable. According to Seafish, we can see on the graph that during the first, before the first lockdown, retail sales increased quite substantially. Canned and froze, frozen seafood products increased around 120% and 75% respectively, compared to 2019 volumes. The effect on fresh and chilled fish was much lower, however, with a spike of around 20%. And after lockdown, the sales of fresh seafood fell again below 2019 level for a few weeks, but then we can see an increase again. So there is a growing trend, not only in fish products, but in all fresh food products, uh, direct marketing. This is the concept of a box where consumers are encouraged to subscribe to a regular delivery. And here on, the, um, on this slide, we can see an example of a fish box company located in Scotland. The Russian Federation. Here I want to focus on a significant disruption in the export value, ex export flows. Russia is among uh, top fishing nations in the world and its export of fish uh, in, the, um, in 2019 exceeded 1.7 million tons. So, and you remember the slide which Marcio showed you about the unique position of fish in the global, uh, global trade. Also in Russia, export of fish is much higher than the export of poultry and meat, six times higher. So this is a huge figure, but the particular situation for Russia is that China is the, by far the biggest market. It accounts for 60% of the Russian fisheries export. But uh, Russian fish supply to China was complicated after coronavirus was detected in frozen fish samples. And the Chinese authorities have introduced a mandatory disinfection of fish products and packaging for fish. But technically, it was very challenging to implement those measures. So unloading delays began already in November of the last year. And serious disruption began in January 2021 when a new season of Alaska Pollock harvesting started in the Sea of Okhotsk. And regarding the volumes here, we speak about uh, annual catch of 1.2 million tons. So basically uh, the fish is, uh, 
the exports have been delayed or completely stopped and uh, there is a big question how to proceed further and how to redirect these big volumes of um, Alaska Pollock. So new export markets have been chosen as a part of the export has been redirected to Vietnam, South Korea, Thailand and other countries, but of course this is not enough. Then production of Alaska Pollock fillet and minced meat were destined for European markets and the USA. So what is the reaction of the Russian authorities? There is a high focus on the domestic market. So first of all, this is reorientation of the fish volumes to the northern and central districts of Russia. Then extra measures are is um, extra measures is that proposal of the all Russia Association of Fishery Industry to organize fish interventions to stimulate demand from budgetary institutions, in particular education, healthcare, and army. And this is estimated to be up to 700,000 tons. And in the meanwhile, we notice a decrease of the retail prices. There are several retail chains reported price drops for Alaska Pollock by 28 to 37 percent in January 2021 compared to the previous year. In the aquaculture sector, uh, which has a rather long production cycle, we don't see so drastic or significant influence of COVID-19 um, on the production volume. Also, of course, some companies experience difficulties. Some of them had to switch to the isolation mode to, um, to decrease and limit all the external contacts. So, all in all, in gradual, uh, with the gradual consol uh, consolation of the, um, uh, of the restrictions, so the demand for fish products started to grow again. But still, if we compare it to the 2019 figures, there is still a gap of 20%. Turkey. So this is a very interesting and a very bright case to show you how the government responded to the current situation and organized um, measures for the population. So the export-oriented Turkish aquaculture sector was directly influenced by the development in the foreign markets. And of course, demand for fish, uh, especially fresh and chilled fish, uh, was down and it was combined with the restrictions, logistical issues in the export market, difficulties, availability of trucks, drivers, and so on and so on. So demand for fresh and chill fish was down, but the demand for frozen whole fish and frozen fish fillets was up by 50% in the European market. So consequently, this boosted sales of frozen products. A very interesting measure was uh, a special campaign for a healthy diet against the coronavirus. Um, this campaign was ordered by the Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, Bekir Pagdemirli. It was uh, carried out under coordination of the General Directorate of Fisheries and Aquaculture of the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of Turkey. The main target of the campaign was to ensure a healthy diet and increase fish consumption in the country. So as contribution to public health during this sensitive period. Of course, it's very important to keep the immune system strong against the several new types of coronavirus. And for this sufficient and balanced diet is required and fish stands out as an excellent component of such a diet. So the Key objective of the campaign was also to give more space to domestic fish, which is produced and caught under control of the ministry. So in practical terms, what was done? Uh, the campaign included um, special actions in the retail and it was broadcasted on the TV and media channels. So the main idea was to sell some fish species, sea bass and sea bream and Turkish salmon for a few days during the spring at a very low cost, basically almost at the production costs. The first campaign started on the 3rd of April and it was meant to last for three days. So the species were sold um, at almost 23 lira and 25 liras per kilo, according to the size. This corresponds to two and a half and 2.8 euros per kilo. 
The key slogan was life at home, fish on the table. And the campaign was so successful with the increased attention from the public that it was decided to prolong this campaign again by two days. So totally it was five days instead of three. Then the second campaign was initiated uh, by the producer unions and retailers, um, other organizations on the April, on the 15th of April. And this campaign was uh, dedicated to Turkish salmon. Whole salmon was sold at 32 Turkish liras and sliced salmon was sold for a maximum of almost 40 Turkish liras within the scope of the campaign. And this corresponds to 3.5 euros and 4.5 euros. So these are examples of the reaction and measures from some countries. And as a conclusion, I would like to say that the outlook for the next several months is still continued uncertainty. And the recent examples underline the volatility of market stability. But on the bright side, the situation looks rather positive with the ongoing medical progress new products and service innovations, shortening of the value chain, new distribution channels, new marketing mechanisms, and all these will jointly benefit the seafood sector as a whole in the next years to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Katarina. Uh, thank you for, for this uh, quite comprehensive and aligned presentation in terms of the issues that we mentioned before. And I think also the countries that you have picked up show how diverse the effects can be in terms of uh, affecting more one specific subsector or, or less. So it was, it was a quite interesting and illustrative uh, presentation. Now we are going to dive uh, into the section of, uh, with our country participants uh, to, try to try to address uh, some additional elements identified by the countries. And in, in fact, what we, try to, what, we are, what we are going to try to do is that uh, try to, uh, since most of the presenters, we, when we are presenting, uh, Ekaterina, myself, and uh, Charlene, we more or less divided uh, the value chain into clusters in terms of distribution, consumption, uh, exports, production. So we are going to do the same now. So we are going to try to uh, invite countries to bring their testimonies in terms of the effects of the COVID-19 in different phases of the value chain. And then let's see uh, what are the national, the differences between the countries, the commonalities, and also see the opportunities because we are not talking only about challenges. We are also talking about opportunities. And to start that, uh, we are going to start exactly with harvesting and processing, the first phase of the value chain. And to start that, it's, it's my pleasure uh, to invite uh, Mr. Abdul Kurbanov uh, from Uzbekistan uh, to uh, introduce this topic in terms of the country uh, uh, perspective and in country information and elements to this uh, part of the value chain. Uh, Mr. Abdullah, please. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to be here and to have a chance to present about the effects of uh, COVID on the agriculture sector in Uzbekistan and in generally to share uh, the practice that we had uh, and the measures that we had uh, from the, our governmental sites to support the fisheries sectors. So uh, yes, uh, my, I will not take it too much time yours. I'm, I know that you are worried. Uh, here is, yes, uh, let me. Uh, okay. Yes, let me start. Then the, um, my presentation will be about uh, only um, will be um, in generally effect of the the COVID uh, the COVID sector uh, COVID to the agriculture sector of Uzbekistan. Yeah, 
uh, during the pandemic, the main risk of uh, for the agriculture, uh, agriculture and fish farming, in particular in the world, were restriction on international trade and agriculture products. Uh, logistic uh, difficulties have to lead interruptions of supply chain of the products to the end consumers in domestic and foreign markets. Factors contributing to decrease in growth in fish industry as well as employment will be decreased in demand in the domestic markets as a result of the decrease in income of the population and the transfers of the funds of labor uh, migrants as a result of uh, economic crisis. In order to prevent the widespread uh, COVID-19 in the Republic of Uzbekistan, the government has announced the necessary measures and the quarantine throughout the country. Due to the quarantine, the transitions from the, some areas to the other areas, areas were prohibited. Across to the country, the people were allowed to take the streets only when absolutely necessary. And this has a major uh, negative impact primarily on the farmers who specialize it in the commercial fish farming. The reason is that the, in these days was not possible to carry out the pre-season pre -season activity like plowing, chiseling, limining uh, of the air spawns. Uh, some facilities were closed. It was not also possible to, as a fish stocking materials need to be uh, brought from other areas. As a result, many, uh, many farmers were unable to stock the ponds or the, the work is done very unsatisfactory. At the same time, um, in air spawned began to appear diseases at the common uh, with the heating of the, in these days in early spring. But it uh, was not possible to buy or bring some essential veterinary drugs to, to that needed to heat, uh, to treat them. And the reason for this is that many organizations were in a quarantine or all flights were canceled. Uh, the situation had a major negative impact, impact on agri agriculture and it's also agriculture sector industry also. In a particular, air spawns were not uh, prepared before the season and uh, natural lakes and artificial lakes were not adequately stocked or stocked with uh, uh, materials and uh, Artificial reproduction, especially with hatcheries, is delayed. The, the, the Republic government has uh, created some convenience for the entrepreneurs after the uh, uh, entrepreneurs affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, some concessions for the loans and the taxes are also announcing, uh, announcing tax holidays. Uh, was established a special funds to provide the finance um, financial assistance to the most uh, influent segments of all agriculture sector. In addition, trucks belonging to the agriculture sectors have been allowed to move without any special uh, uh, permits. Uh, this uh, the also our from our governmental side has a made, uh, the government has a made a special effort. Uh, the, especially the president give the order to work uh, directly with the farmers, uh, directly with the farmers. Um, I mean, going, uh, calling to the each uh, farmers who is uh, doing the producing the fish trade, trade side fishes or artificial fisheries uh, to know the, what the problem they have and work with them uh, openly. So, and uh, also made the, some uh, tax holidays. I also already, I already uh, told it and um, make them uh, possible to move without any permission. And also these who has uh, import and export operations, uh, they were done without any uh, restriction or without any um, banning. Uh, in the region, special attention was paid to the transition to all joint measures from the atomic system to the individual management system, especially in the field of the food security. Uh, according to the measures that was done by the, our government, the, in general, generally, the agriculture sector was not too much affected uh, by the COVID uh, pandemics. But uh, at the same time, the production was also increased. Yeah, here is the on the slides you can see that the production was also increased. 
this is a uh, thanks to the our um, support from the governmental uh, individual management system yeah that the, the uh, local authorities uh, work it with uh, tightly with the private sector also and fish cluster also uh, in 2019 were also increased number of the clusters uh, and uh, the uh, totally production capacity tons also increased it. Uh, the, it was uh, in 2019, it was 11, uh, but uh, in 2020, the cluster unions uh, increased in more, more than double. Yeah? And also production was also increased. Uh, and the number of also hatcheries also were uh, positively because um, uh, at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the, the pandemic, we were um, able to uh, inform our government that uh, without support, without the special support from the governmental sides, the fishery sector will be affected very much. So they um, they were announced that, that uh, all fish farmers has a uh, tax holidays. Yeah, so uh, for the several months, they were allowed not to pay any taxes. And also they were allowed to move without any restriction and also they were allowed to buy to if they needed some uh, uh, drugs and or fee this they can take uh, for the to taking the, the goods but not paying paying is uh, later on, so this is also was a kind of big support from the governmental side. And uh, yeah, we also, uh, government started to pay attention more uh, supporting the intensive, intensive and semi-intensive agriculture, uh, in, especially during the, uh, this pandemic times, um, uh, government started to pay uh, to increasing number of the intensive agricultures, yeah. So uh, the, in 2000, yeah, totally, and uh, it was uh, in 2020, the production more than was more than uh, increased more than fifteen thousand. Yeah, and in in totally the nearly uh, one three quarter of the production came from the intensive aquaculture. But at the same time, semi intensive aquaculture also increased. It. Uh, cold water fishing farmers. Uh, this is also one of the. Um, uh, how to say one of the um, uh, promising the, the technology, promising the ways to increase the fish production in Uzbekistan. So government uh, started to pay to close the attention to the increase uh, uh, more export, export oriented fish or high value fishes in order to uh, be able to export the fishes. So uh, from 2019 and 2020, now the number of the uh, existing 16 fish farming has been established. Uh, and uh, the currently they also you know, started to produce. Uh, I mean that they currently producing more than 2,000, uh, uh, yeah, 2,700 commercial fish production. And uh, fish processing uh, here is also it was also from the support from the government uh, for the uh, fish processors. Fish processors were supported by the government to uh, by. Um, I mean, the, it was allowed it not to pay uh, for the electricity for the uh, during the quarantine time. Yeah, uh, it was also allowed it not to pay for the uh, gas that you use it or some uh, additionally um, the supply from the the government. You can use it without not paying. Uh, then they will after the uh, finishing this. Uh, uh, pandemic uh, period. I mean, the um, lockdown. When they finished, they started to return the the use it the money that used it for the electricity and, and etc. This is also was a um, very big support from our government, especially for the uh, fish processors also. And in spite of this uh, pandemic, the after announcement of the pandemic in the connection with the spread of COVID nineteen. The president of the uh, Republic of Uzbekistan took measures to preserve the activity of the agriculture sector in country. Support was provided uh, to the domestic pro uh, producers of livestock and agriculture, as well as fish producers. Uh, so uh, we uh, planned uh, during this pandemic time in order to support our local population. Uh, we pr prepared the special program to support small-scale fish farming at the home base. It. Yeah, and they uh, provided a low, uh, low rate, low rate uh, credits, and uh, not uh, they were able not to pay uh, 
at the beginning uh, it was not allowed not to pay the the loans but more more than three months yeah when, when that uh, yeah i'm sorry and uh, uh, so and there was also uh, thanks to the green corridors yeah created by the government of Uzbekistan for the timely delivering the materials and the fertilizers and the fees to farmers and the significant decreases of productivity of the fish farmers uh, it was not observed and uh, by the supporting the local fish farmers and especially small scale fish farmers who is uh, very influenced on this uh, sector uh, at the end of the year, uh, the level of income citizen of Uzbekistan from self-employment in October is exceeded uh, the March figures by 11%. Yeah, it's a. Uh, in generally, we can uh, uh, we can conclude that the um, support, especially support from the government, uh, was very essential for the during the pandemic time, and it helped it a lot of. It helped it a lot of to. To support uh, self support the, the farmers and um, and the, the beginning of the from the beginning the government will say that uh, without uh, food and the food security for us it's a pri priority sector so we have to pay a uh, huge attention and in order not to stop the day working so uh, the, from the beginning uh, it was uh, paid a lot of attention uh, to all sectors of the agriculture especially fish farming also yeah this is at the current time for myself thank you very much thank you thank you mr uh, and uh, thank you for this comprehensive overview of the situation and the role that the government played in terms of trying to 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 reduce the impact and also create new opportunities uh, without further ado let's let's go let's move throughout the, the the value chain in terms of distribution and retail now and uh, now we are going to move to the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, Mrs. Kinaga Imankuat. Uh, please, you have the floor. Добрый день, уважаемые участники вебинара. Я хочу поблагодарить организаторов вебинара и Хайдара за то, что они организовали сейчас на сегодняшний день один из, одну из самых подняли, то есть одну из самых актуальных проблем и вызовов в сегодняшней реальности. Вот, прослушав многие доклады, ну, понятно, что в действительности мир изменился с этим ковидом. Изменилась тактика и стратегия маркетинга Даже соседняя страна, Узбекистан, я смотрю, и там и поддержка большая со стороны государства происходит, и производство у них выросло уже в прошлом году, они произвели 144 тысяч тонн. Мы, конечно, страна маленькая, экономика слабая, производим, наше достижение за прошлый год это всего лишь нам 45 тысяч тонн, поэтому говорить, что... Ковид как-то сильно повлиял на рыбную отрасль Кыргызстана. Ну, сложно говорить, потому что влияние оно было неоднозначным. У нас в основном это мелкомасштабное производство рыбы. Крупные производители – это буквально 3-4 компании у нас в Кыргызстане. К примеру, вот производство радужной форели – это единственный экспортоориентированный вид рыбы на производство форели пандемии не оказала никакого влияния, хотя корма мы закупаем на Западе в Европе, оплодотворенный икру также закупаем в Европе, но тем не менее, несмотря на то, что были вот закрыты многие сообщения воздушные, Но икра и корма поставлялись вовремя. Единственное только, конечно, что на, на что оказала влияние пандемия, это резкий скачок валюты иностранной. У нас они покупают и корма, и икру на валюту иностранную. И, естественно, 
себестоимость рыбы выросла, но отпускная цена она осталась на прежнем уровне. То есть доходная часть фермеров, конечно, на доходную часть это оказало большое влияние. Также следует отметить, что в пунктах пропуска на государственных границах с Казахстаном границы были закрыты, и это оказало большое влияние на перевозку охлажденной и замороженной рыбной продукции, тем более на скоропортящая продукция, и, естественно, это оказало, оказалось на качестве товара. И необходимо также отметить, что пандемия оказала влияние на карповодство, то есть на те фермерские хозяйства, которые выращивают растительноядные виды рыб, потому что основной рыбопосадочный материал закупается в Казахстане, граница с Казахстаном была закрыта, и многие фермеры не смогли, конечно, зарыбить свои пруды рыбопосадочным материалом, но это, конечно, скажется у нас уже через два года, вот, этот, вот эта вот дыра. Потом э, пострадали, незначительно, конечно, пострадали рынки э, сбыта, рестораны, они в этот момент были закрыты, но у нас основной период реализации местной рыбы – это осень. Осенью уже ситуация нормализовалась, многие кафе, рестораны и магазины, базары начали открываться, они начали ну, с какими-то ограничительными мерами начали свою деятельность по соблюдением протоколов, поэтому особо сказала выше пандемии особо отметить, потому что у нас ну, небольшое производство. Оно мелкомасштабное производство, и рыбная отрасль у нас только начинает развиваться, поэтому особо таких ощутимых воздействий не оказала пандемия. Ну и со стороны государства, надо отметить, никакого, никакой помощи не было оказано ни в плане субсидирование, не в плане там, оказания материальной помощи или отсрочки кредит, кредитов. То есть в этом плане государство не оказало никакую помощь. Фермеры сами обходились своими силами. Вот и все, что я хотела сказать. Спасибо большое за внимание. In terms of providing, and it was very fascinating to see the difference between the rainbow trout effects and the carp production. It was very, very interesting to see how two species in the same countries they have behaved completely different in terms of the, the effects and the opportunity that was, was presented. So say thank you very much. But without further ado, because we are just running out of time, uh, I would like to invite uh, Uh, our, the representative, the managing director of Al Marina in Albania, uh, to bring some uh, 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 elements, the distribution and retail aspects and effects of the pandemic. Please, uh, Mr. Uh, Condi, you have the floor. Hello, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> and in Albania normally have uh, some effects from uh, from uh, pandemic in our sector, but uh, if uh, I can speak for for my company is on uh, special cases because uh, we work uh, we have we have not not a lot uh, uh, negative effect from from. Uh, during the, the pandemic years. There are some factors for, for this, uh, for this uh, situation. We sell our product in uh, supermarkets in Italy and in Europe. During the pandemic, uh, we can sell, uh, we sell more. Uh, 
20-25% uh, uh, more. Uh, we sell uh, all, the, all the our product go to Italy uh, European community. We, we send to, to Italy every, every week two or three trucks. And this is a, it was a born uh, abundance because in Italy and Europe restaurants, small shops was closed and uh, all the product go on the supermarkets. The second advantage was uh, our position, position, geographic position. We are near another uh, countries like uh, Greece and Turkey, and Turkey. Our trucks can go quickly to Italy. To Italy, um, we work. Uh, our farm produces uh, 40, 45 percent of products of all Albania. We grow uh, brim and bass. I sell uh, the fresh to Italy quickly. Uh, during the pa during the the, 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 the pa pandemic, uh, the roads ports were was uh, was free. Um, trucks drivers was free, and uh, it was uh, was good uh, good uh, good factor. After um, the sector of uh, the the suspension and limitation of. Uh, Marine fisheries was is is was one factor more more good for 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 uh, for ourselves. Uh, in Albania, uh, in Albania, the aquaculture represent uh, uh, the sector of uh, marine aquaculture was was uh, the big because. Uh, on, uh, uh, on the shore, don't have a lot, have a little uh, trout, and uh, aquaculture is very, very small. The aquaculture, the, the marine aquaculture, uh, was positioned in in the south of Albania, in Gulf of Lora and Saranda, near near of of the Greece. Uh, uh, Eighty percent, ninety percent of products is here in Gulf of uh, of Lora. Uh, our company export all the products and uh, there are some small and medium companies, uh, farms, medium farms near of our farms, uh, which uh, sell all the products in the, in the market local. Normally for this company have some, have uh, uh, some problems, economic problems. E e normally economic pro pro problems. Uh, our production is uh, is uh, uh, may uh, 60 60 percent of uh, of uh, all of the products, and uh, for three months in the spring of two, 2020, don't don't sell or sell a little. Uh, no. Of course, was was a, a big problems for for this farm. Uh, the, the government don't don't uh, don't support don't support the, the state don't di, did not provide the, any assistance for this company. Only some um, uh, three hundred euro in months for two or three people. Uh, in real, uh, really, uh, this company don't. Uh, All, all the people, all the workers, or the was uh, was working. Don't uh, don't doubt. This is uh, this is our uh, uh, situation, and uh, we 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 continue to, to to sell. In this period, we sell three or four trucks to 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 Italy, and uh, the product go go up. And the, the, the sales increases. I, this is the situation. Um, 
in general in our farm and in, uh, in marine aquaculture in, in Albania. Okay. Uh, I think I, I thank you for 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 this uh, for this uh, meeting and. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think it was very interesting uh, to, to see the, the private sector perspective too, in terms of, of what are the, the, the main challenges and opportunities, and also no disruption in the case of the exports to Italy, as, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, to finalize this move throughout the value chain, uh, let's let's go to Ukraine. Uh, we have Mr. Uh, Ovidinik, uh, who is going to, to give us a testimony on also this, this this segment of the value chain approach. Please, you have the floor. Uh, hello, do you hear me good? Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, I would like to welcome uh, all organizers and uh, participants of this event. And um, I'm really grateful for uh, the invitation to take part in it. And uh, I think that uh, uh, such uh, events are very useful for uh, exchanging uh, of experience how to react uh, to such uh, uh, to such situation as uh, COVID-19, um, uh, I will uh, shortly describe the situation in um, the situation in Ukraine, uh, how uh, how uh, how its uh, COVID-19 impacted uh, the fishery sector, uh, Ukrainian fishery sector, uh, in particular in first half of uh, 2020 uh, was the most uh, difficult period uh, the, due to the active uh, increase of uh, incidents of COVID. Uh, the government uh, was uh, forced uh, to take uh, unprecedented uh, measures for, uh, uh, for our country. Uh, actually, it was uh, uh, all economic activities was restricted in Ukraine. Almost uh, all intercity and uh, urban transportation uh, was stopped. Uh, places for entertainment uh, and um, uh, public catering markets and uh, other retail uh, spaces was uh, closed. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, all these measures uh, have uh, undoubtedly uh, affected the fishing uh, industry in some aspects. Uh, in general, uh, the spread of uh, COVID uh, did not critically affect uh, actually opportunities for uh, fishing and aquaculture, but. Uh, uh, these uh, restrictive measures had uh, a significant uh, impact uh, uh, on uh, demand of fisheries uh, products uh, due to uh, uh, reduced uh, purchasing power. Uh, uh, according to uh, our estimates, um, the uh, uh, fishing uh, sales uh, uh, decreased up to 40%. Um, um, uh, also, it was uh, difficulties with uh, logistics, uh, supply, uh, it's namely supply fish uh, to uh, uh, supply fish to uh, retail chains, uh, limited opportunities for uh, citizens to use public transport. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, also reduction of a uh, number of places to sell products uh, due to uh, closures of markets, uh, shopping malls, uh, bars, restaurants, uh, public catering and others. And uh, actually, in uh, to lesser extent, to lesser extent, the COVID affected uh, also the growth of uh, uh, of value for uh, fish and fish products, in particular aquaculture, because Ukrainian aquaculture uh, in uh, some uh, in some kind depended from uh, imported uh, imported feeds. 
uh, and uh, due to the difficulties uh, with uh, uh, closing borders, uh, uh, feeds, uh, prices for feeds were uh, a little bit growing and um, uh, and also it's affected uh, prices for um, uh, actually uh, aquaculture production. Um, uh, given uh, given this range of um, of mentioned problems uh, in Ukraine uh, has begun to to develop uh, an international uh, internet trade. Uh, I mean to um, sell uh, fish and fish products uh, uh, via. Uh, Direct websites of stores, uh, uh, social networks, uh, um, uh, social networks uh, that offering home delivery, uh, and uh, also uh, fish vendors uh, was selling uh, started to sell uh, their products uh, through the large uh, market spaces. Um, uh, uh, also, there is uh, delivery companies significantly uh, extended the scope of their activities and uh, uh, by offering deliveries, uh, delivery of goods from uh, those retail chains uh, that uh, uh, wasn't providing uh, any delivery services. Uh, also, uh, uh, to react uh, to these new challenges, uh, uh, our government um, uh, later, uh, I guess in the middle of summer, introduced more flexible mechanisms uh, for imposing quarantine uh, restrictions. Uh, it was uh, named um, it was named adaptive quarantine, which uh, allows to strengthen or weaken such restrictions in uh, certain uh, regions of the state. Adaptive quarantine is. Uh, based, uh, on the your, your sound, your, your sound is, is really, is really poor. You hear me now? Uh, yeah. I hear yeah. you. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I guess I need to repeat uh, a little. Now, in the middle of summer, uh, our government, uh, government uh, introduced um, a more flexible mechanism to uh, imposing uh, quarantine uh, restrictions. Um, it was named uh, adaptive quarantine, and um, it was based on uh, on the uh, on the level. Uh, uh, the you have to approach the mic again. Sorry. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, now it's fine. Oh, oh th uh, that's good. Uh, and it would depend on the uh, level uh, of uh, affected by um, uh, by COVID uh, uh, nineteen people uh, in certain region. Uh, this uh, approach um, avoided the mass restriction of uh, business activities through the country and help uh, help to intensify economic activity in the field of fisheries also there is uh, was introduced some uh, preferences to um, uh, public catering like uh, restaurants uh, restaurants pubs bars uh, uh, who uh, which uh, selling uh, dishes to uh, to eat outside and uh, also, uh, government was uh, compensated some uh, fixed amount uh, of money to producers, uh, which uh, uh, was uh, which limited their activities uh, for some time. It was uh, a government program, and um, I would like to mention that uh, actually this. Uh, Internet, uh, uh, internet trade and buying fish from home, it's actually like uh, 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 like a new trend and uh, new habits for Ukraine. Um, in this regard, uh, I, I think I think I will stop here and thank you for attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Very very interesting as as again. 
I'll say it matches perfectly with the overall, particularly the framework that uh, Charlene, for example, highlighted in the new trends of, uh, of trade in terms of deliverables, uh, the new deliveries uh, methods for fish and fish products. And also Ekaterina mentioned some of the issues that you just touched upon. So uh, after going through all these, the value chain with the first one of different countries, I just would like to reiterate that for the open debate now, uh, participants can pose their questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Haidar for the coordination of this uh, open debate, but please use the Q&A box to pose questions. Thank you, thank you to all. It was a very productive discussion, a very productive uh, amount of useful elements that we brought to the discussion and to the general knowledge of our audience. Thank you again to all the participants. Uh, thank you, Marcio, and to thank you to all panelists for their reliable uh, contribution. Uh, dear colleagues, now we would like to have an active uh, debate as much as possible. First, I mean, I have some question which has been addressed to, to the panelists. But uh, meanwhile, uh, as uh, underlined by Marcio, we would like also to get your oral intervention remarks for this session. The, uh, the first question that addressed to us is most uh, related to the key remarks made by the many panelists, in particular, Akaterina, who underlined that I mean, in our region, many countries took measures to mitigate the negative impacts of the pandemic on fisheries and aquaculture industry. And uh, most of these countries gave a very special focus on the support of domestic production. So the question follows, <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, participants says that, okay, against that background, okay, many countries uh, imposed some fisheries import bans. Are there appropriate is it appropriate to impose such ban under the current uh, WHTO rules? Marshall, maybe you will to provide an answer to this question. I hope uh, the, my question was uh, clear because I also had some uh, difficulties in understanding uh, the, the, some panelists. Please. Yeah, may, maybe I'll start and then Katarina, please, if you want to jump in and add more uh, the local dimension, because I just would, I, I think that the examples that we had in all interventions and presentations were very associated with new niches for local distribution. But in terms of the WTO, and that, that I'll leave to Katarina to answer that. But in terms of the WTO, I just would like to reiterate that any kind of restriction imposed at the border of a country has to be aligned with science-based measures. Uh, we cannot go to impose any restriction, which is in terms of the import of a product, which is not science-based oriented. And in this regard, uh, I would like to reiterate uh, so far that uh, the, double, the, the World Health Organization has stated that there is no evidence that uh, the virus of the COVID-19 virus can be transmitted through food or package. So this is something that there is so far for the moment, there is no evidence on that. Uh, and uh, if a country wants to impose restrictions on based on that, it has to prove in, in scientific basis, why they are imposing restrictions to that. And then, uh, uh, sorry, I, I maybe I'll give to Katarina to um, uh, explore a little bit about these nuances of the leveraging of local consumption based on the restrictions of export. Yes, um, 
I would say this is a very difficult question and I think it's um, there are not so many clear answers we can provide because first of all um, many countries pandemic so there are no common clear rules even if they are each country can introduce the emergency situation and based on this emergency situation the country can impose its own rules so it's very difficult to interpret and um, because you see now it happens in the eu in the european union where countries do not agree between themselves on certain issues on the border restrictions on and so on and so on so it's um, i would say we are now in the very turbulent situation and the only way is uh, for the country and for the aquaculture producers for the fisheries producers and so on for the stakeholders of the industry that we need in one way to adjust as soon as possible immediately to the uh, requirements of the countries and at the same time focus on the domestic markets because rules in many countries they are changing quite uh, suddenly unexpectedly and so on but of course we cannot just abandon let's say this idea of the um, importance of the expert but just it, it it confirms that the expert has to be diversified they always diversified in terms of products in terms of countries uh, product forms and so on and so on and of course we need to adjust to the situation to the requirements of the countries and at the same time diversify our expert and at the same time work with our domestic market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a, an additional additional uh, question which is related, related to supply of brood stock in the Central Asia the, the, the question says whether the region has some problems in, in getting uh, suitable uh, broad stocks. Uh, to my uh, knowledge, in the past, there were some regular program for uh, selection and the use of the broad stock in the region. And some countries are, are, are able to, to, to stay in a good uh, broad stock pool, but some are dependent on the supply from the other countries. And I would like to uh, pose this question also to Uzbekistan, Abdullah. Abdullah, maybe you can provide an aspect to this and consider the fact that now uh, the both fisheries and in particular aquaculture industry is witnessing a big progress in Uzbekistan. So could you please uh, touch on a bit on the broad stock, uh, the importance of the broad stock uh, supply in your aquaculture, please. In particular, and culture-based fisheries, please. Спасибо, уважаемый Хайдарбек. Да, действительно, на сегодняшний день сектор аквакультуры и в целом рыболовный сектор в Узбекистане развивается с хорошими темпами. По поводу использования племенного маточного стада и в целом маточный стад играет один из важных ролей для развития данного сектора. Почему? Потому что в прошлом году, то есть в 2019 году, было в Узбекистан завезено э, племенной маточный стадо из Венгрии с нашим венгерским коллегом в э, Малаинской области и в других регионах привезли прямоматочные поголовья. А, еще в этом году мы планируем с, российских, э, э, с Россией привезти э, из английского рыбоводного хозяйства э, тоже э, хорошего маточного поголовья, и помимо этого еще планируем завести э, чисто, чистокровные э, личинки, личинки рыбосачные материалы в целом в, в дальнейшем, чтобы у нас у себя э, развивать и э, работать на данном направлении. 
Это является это очень актуальным. В целом на сегодняшний день в, в Узбекистане ведется проект по ФАО именно по развитию сектора аквакультуры. Международные специалисты тоже в этом утвердили, что необходимо обновлять существующие маточные поголовья и обновлять их не, скажем так, ну, кровь, а обновлять кровы, чтобы те виды, которые у нас, те стада, которые у нас есть, это еще было завезено, не знаю, ну, при Советском Союзе, да, после за последние там 20 лет не было такого специального э, уделенного внимания, чтобы развивать именно по селекционной племенной работы. Благодаря э, правительству Узбекистана, особенно благодаря нашему президенту, особенно уделяется в, внимание по, э, по именно созданию селекционно племенного хозяйства. И в, прош, в прошлом году было постановление президента о субсидировании, э, субсидировании э, фермерских хозяйцев, которые будут завозить в Узбекистан э, племенной маточный стадо за рубежом. Это тоже на сегодняшний день как бы очень позитивно повлияло. Э, многие фермеры уже знают, что, что государство, государство будет получать определенные поддержки э, в этом направлении. Начали сейчас организовать сотрудничество с разными странами. Да, это вот Первое, то, что мы, у нас сейчас получилось, это наши карповые, да, обычный карп, но в среднесрочном и долгосрочной перспективе мы хотим еще более расширить список культивируемых видов рыб, которые на сегодняшний день в Узбекистане производятся. Поэтому э, маточные поголовья. В прошлом году, я помню, было много вебинаров, семинаров, которые были организованы с разными международными организациями по именно культивированию и содержанию маточного поголовья и в целом по рыбоводству. Эти направления, эти... Э, Семинары были очень полезны для рыбоводных предпринимателей, которые на сегодняшний день уже занимаются, а именно по как содержать и как дальнейшее их культивировать или, скажем так, более обновленный метод, улучшенный метод воспроизводства, профилактические методы и так далее, и так далее. Исходя из своего заключения, я бы хотел сказать, что в этом направлении в Узбекистане да, действительно особо уделяется внимание по созданию селекционно-племенного хозяйства. И в среднесрочной, благосрочной перспективе мы обязательно будем работать и с холодноводными рыбами, которые на сегодняшний день в Узбекистане в определенной степени разводятся. Это вот сибирские осетры, форели, лосисовых, да чтобы у нас тоже своя линия маточной поголовья, племенная хотя бы была, чтобы мы смогли эффективно воспроизводством заняться. Спасибо. Thank you much, Abdullah, for this information. Now we have another question. I mean, interestingly, our case studies shows that, okay, despite the serious challenges posed by the pandemic, there has been even a production increase in the region. So the question says that, just a second please, without a clear indication of future, future of domestic and international markets, markets how such a increase in uh, fisheries could be sustainable. I will be happy, uh, Shirlen, if you answer this question, please. Yeah, thank you, Haida. I think I, I made a comment on that question that appeared. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, just to uh, maybe, you know, for everyone to have a... Um, I think when we are talking about uh, increasing production, we have to be very careful about um, selecting the species of uh, the country and also the region. You know, uh, we, we cannot just go on increasing production of something which is not, first of all, not suitable for our, for our country um, environment, just because it um, has a demand uh, in the international market. So, We have to be mindful of what are the species which are popular in the local market. Of course, uh, something that also is, um, that can be farmed. At the same time, uh, we have to be also uh, aware or 
what are the species which are have good demand in the international market? For example, uh, I'm just giving an example for shrimp. Uh, the demand is really strong, um, you know, international market, and also it's also increasingly popular in many of the local markets uh, with the introduction of Waname. Uh, Waname is making shrimp more affordable now. So we see a lot of markets, a lot of uh, countries are already producing them themselves, and, and much of this is going for the local production. So uh, really, it, it, it boils down to uh, reviewing uh, what, what works for the country and also um, what works at the international market. Thank you very much, Shinan, for this uh, response. Now I think it is uh, time to pass to the conclusion the remarks part. Uh, I invite uh, my colleague Marcio again to, to underline some of the, the key messages or remarks from this uh, webinar. Thank you, and uh, uh, thank you for, to all for, for the present. I think it was a very interesting seminar in terms that well, we are able to show exactly the nuances of different countries, uh, sometimes different regions. And uh, I just would like to, to show to you that during the country presentations of the challenges and opportunities, we try to map what countries are were saying in terms of the challenges and opportunities. And it's quite interesting to, to know that many opportunities appear. The, the green ones that are listed here are opportunities. So when we talk about COVID-19 and fisheries and aquaculture, we have to have this dual perspective. Of course, we do have the challenges. But at the same time, new opportunities are arising, and we have to take advantage of that. So in this regard, I would like again to thank you all for, for your presence here. I think uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it was a very nice event. Uh, FAO together with the with Infofish and Eurofish, we are always available to be contact regarding information dissemination, regarding uh, providing uh, uh, instruments that we use for best practices, providing technical support. Uh, in the presentations that are going to be available, you, all of you are going to have our contact detail. And once again, in order for the sector to be better prepared for challenges and opportunities, information is fundamental. Accessing information about markets, about trade is fundamental. And in this regard, Infofish, Eurofish, and FAO can support all of you in, in, in accessing that disinformation. So please get in touch with us all whenever you need. And I would like to thank you all again for being present here. Thank you all the participants, all the speakers, all the panelists, and thank you our regional office in FAO for organizing that. Thank you all, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Marcio, for your remarks. Uh, after this, it is time now to terminate our webinar. I would like to thank all participants, the speakers, panelists, for their valuable inputs. My special thanks also go to the organizers, interpreters, technical and communication team working behind the skin for making this event possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you very much, bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you.